All right. All right. Um, talk a bit about Bob Wood, who you just mentioned, what he was like and what his management style was like. Bob Wood is president of CBS uh, Television Network, you know, which included uh, programming sports, all programs except news, in addition to uh, sales, affiliate relations, advertising, and promotion. I mean, everything that had to do with the network, broadcast standards and practices. And he was a great man. He was the best, uh, I think he's the best boss that I've ever worked for. Because he was bright and he, he was a broadcaster. You know, he came up through the stations division at CBS and made his, uh, his name out here running KNX. I mean, he was, as general manager at KNX, he put the big news on the air. Jerry Dunphy, the first hour-long news show in the country. And that's when this state, Channel 2 here, was uh, so far ahead of everyone else. And they were doing 30 ratings, 35 ratings, uh, at 6 o'clock at night, you know, with the big news. And uh, he, he uh, caught their attention in New York, got promoted to uh, the head of their company-owned stations, the whole division, and then became president of the network shortly before Mike left. I mean, they, didn't, they just didn't get along. And he was pushing very hard that the network, from a station background, and having to live with the Red Skeltons and, and, and all those old shows, you know, that we just had to urbanize. We had to have a more urban network, a younger network, a more sophisticated network. And uh, we got along great. We got along great because he, he uh, never purported to know a lot about programming. He had his opinions, and uh, at some time he was right, some time he wasn't, but he was really a smart guy, and he was a good guy. And he would, uh, he really would just let you go. I mean, he was a man of great courage, great courage. And I, I came to him with a couple of things at the last minute, and he said, go ahead and do it. You know, like uh, moving all in the family to Saturday night, two weeks before the start of the season. So he, he had great courage and, uh, and, and got along very well with the community out here. You know, the stars out here loved him. People like Bob Newhart and Don Rickles were his best friends. And uh, he was part of that old uh, USC group. You know, he was uh, fanatic about USC and their football team and, uh, and was really a good guy. You know, I, I uh, you know, I thought he was the best network president that I've ever, I've ever seen. It made my life a lot easier. Talk a bit about the corporate culture at the time at CBS, particularly what the term Tiffany Network meant to you and sort of in the halls at CBS. <laughs> well, the corporate culture there, they were, most of the executives were really kind of Greenwich Country Club. You know, they were very, uh, very, very lazy. You know, they were not scrappy. They were not fighters. They were, uh, they, you were used to having it all. And the fact of the matter is, is that I, as I took the job over, you know, we didn't have it all. You know, we had some, some real problems. You know, daytime in 1970 was, uh, was in a, still in a state of flux. And the prime time, as I said, was, uh, I mean, we were neck and neck with NBC, so there was a, it was a very hollow victory to win by a tenth of a point. Our demographics were just awful, so there was a lot of work that had to be done. We had no late night schedule to speak of. We were trying out the 15th formula in the early morning, you know, so it just it, it needed a total redo, the network. And the group of executives that were there in advertising and promotion and station relations were used to the days when we would have a 200% a advantage over the number two network. So they were still operating on a different clock. More complacent. And, yeah, it was, diff it was very, very tough to get things done there. You know, my, to my frustration, I was not in charge of uh, promotion or business affairs at CBS. So everything was a negotiation to, uh, to get things done. So let's talk about the turnaround then. You talk about the shows with the older demographics, and you talk about some of the, earlier you mentioned some of the sort of the lousy 
fumbling, ham-fisted attempts at younger skewing shows. Talk about that gradual turnaround process. Well, the first thing that happened was something that we had very little to do with. It was a show called All in the Family, which was developed uh, at ABC, and they didn't know what to do with it. You know, they had just they just had a fiasco uh, called Turn On that George Slaughter produced that lasted one week. You know, that was just the biggest embarrassment, the most tasteless show you've ever seen. And uh, on the basis of that, they did all in the family. The guy, the head of programming, almost got fired. He said, absolutely not. We don't want to have anything to do with it. So Norman Lear and his agent, Sam Cohn, came over to see Bob Wood. And at that point in time, Mike Dan was still there. And I was in the meeting. And, uh, and we saw all in the family. And I, you know, I couldn't believe I was seeing what I was seeing. You know, because this thing was compared to the crap that we were canceling. I mean, this this was really uh, setting new boundaries. And to Bob Wood's credit, he said, I love this show. we got to put this on the air. This is good for co television. It's good for the nation. It's, uh, and he had a major, major fight with Paley, who hated the show. But he prevailed, and, uh, and they kind of snuck it on the air in January. It's January after I had gotten the job, and they... Uh, they put it on Tuesday night at 9.30. And the lead-in, to show you what a lousy time period, they gave it, the, the lead-in was Hee Haw. And the show at 10 o'clock was the CBS News Hour. So in terms of scheduling, you couldn't find a worse time period in the schedule you now to put this thing. And, uh, and everybody was concerned that they were going to, you know, we were going to, it was going to be another Ubi Doobie. You know, where there would be hundreds of thousands of calls coming in. I was there that night. I went, just out of curiosity, went to the switchboard at, uh, I think we were still at 485 then. And uh, I think they got 20 calls in New York, you know, for the, uh, the East Coast and Central uh, feeds. 20 calls, which is nothing. And... Uh, you know, it was kind of a tempest in a teapot. It opened with moderate ratings. In those days, it was I think it had a 28 share, which in those days was really marginal. And, uh, you know, and we all said, Jesus, all this brouhaha for nothing. And what happened is that over the course of uh, the spring, it, people started to talk about the show, and it started very gradually to build, but... There was the word of mouth was enormous, and the Emmys then were, I believe, in May, and it swept the Emmy Awards. It just, it really swept the Emmy Awards, and uh, and from that point on, started to build uh, in in uh, in the summer, in spite of the time period. Uh, Paley had so little faith in the show that he said, "Well, you can renew it, but I don't want it early. We got to keep it away from uh, young kids and everything," and they put it on. Uh, 10.30 Monday night following uh, My Three Sons. So that's where it was scheduled for full, which is a throwaway, 10.30 Monday night. You know, in the, in the meantime, on Saturday night, uh, you know, we had uh, a new show called Funny Face with Sandy Duncan. And uh, I think that was on at 8.30 and... Uh, I forget, I think Three Sons was on at 8 o'clock, and Arnie was on 10 o'clock Monday. But at any rate, it's Saturday night. Looked really bleak. You had My Three Sons, which was 85 years old, and Sandy Duncan, which was a, the show is really a dog. Wasn't any good. And in August, you know, I'm getting, this is really my first fall. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, Saturday night, we got My Three Sons, which is going to die. NBC had this highly touted new show called Partners with Don Adams, which is kind of a, a remake of Get Smart with Cops, and Sandy Duncan, which was just awful. And, uh, and I said, I, I, this is going to be my first and last season. I can see it now. You know? And I went out, and a couple of things struck me. You know, they, they were taping all in the family, and these shows were terrific. And the second thing was we had Mary Tyler Moore, scheduled on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock in between the Beverly Hillbillies and Hee Haw. 
So that was uh, that was that scheduling, you know. And uh, and I, I looked at Mary Tyler Moore and I said, "This is such a terrific show. We got this sitting in, in the middle of all this these shit kicker shows." And uh, and I called him up, and it was a couple of weeks before the start of the season. I said, "Bob, you know, we really are. We got We got We have some resources. We got to. We got to deploy them in a better way." And I'm just please listen. I think that All in the Family can be a major hit for us. Let's get it out of that time period. Put it at the beginning of Saturday. Let's do a simple flip. You know, we'll do a simple flip where we'll take All in the Family, put it at 8, and take my three sons and put it uh, at 10.30 Monday. It's the last year anyway. And I said, the second thing you, really, you, should, you should consider doing, it's Mary Tyler Moore. It's such a smart show. Let's put it on Saturday night. You got Dick Van Dyke at nine o'clock. Let's put it at nine thirty, and we'll move. I don't know. I have Pogan's Heroes, whatever the hell was in there. Move it to Tuesday. Let Tuesday be the receptacle for all the crap that uh, that we we weren't able to cancel yet. And so at least now you got Mary Tyler Moore on a, on on the beginning of a good night, and you got all in the family leading it off. So you got a, a real shot at building something on Saturday night. And uh, he said, let me think about it. He called me back about an hour later and said, go. Yeah, because he had a check with his boss. But uh, he said, go. And uh, two or three weeks later, the shows went on the air. And all in the family just, I called the research department. And then you got New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And I said, what, what are the shares? He said, New York, 80. <laughs> Los Angeles, 68. Chicago, 72. You know, and I said, well, now, we were partying last night. What's going on here? You know, why are you, why are you doing this to me? And those were the shares. I mean, it just exploded. Uh, so the, the Funny Face with Sandy Duncan, which was really a door, wasn't a very good show, opened with a 55 share, you know, off of All in the Family, 65 in the National. So, and, uh, and Mary Tyler Moore did very well, too, at 930. did in the high 30s. So these are your first... Building so this blocks. was real, these were the this was the beginning. These were the first building blocks. There was nothing else out of that season that was uh, salvageable. A bunch of junk, but we had all in the family thanks to ABC, and uh, and the beginning. And from there, you know, the two key shows in the development of CBS over the next several years were all in the family and Mary Tyler Moore, and the people involved, because. Uh, you know, Mary Tyler Moore, that company, gave us Bob Newhart, gave us Rhoda. Uh, Norman Lear, God bless him, you know, we did a series of spinoffs. We did Maud, Good Times, Jefferson's, One Day at a Time. Uh, and these shows were scheduled throughout the, the schedule. So these two producers, and then you add a couple of other shows like MASH, uh, Sonny and Cher, Kojak, The Waltons. We're going to get to all of these individuals. Yeah, but in a matter of uh, about two and a half, three seasons, you know, we were doing a 22 rating in prime time. You know, and our next competitor was doing a 17. And, uh, and it had demographics, the best demographics the network ever had. I mean, just fabulous. Uh, you know, WCBS New York was the number one station. So it just totally turned around, but we got very lucky at the beginning. You know, anybody that tells you any, uh, you know, a lot of the moves that we made were moves out of desperation. You know, it wasn't, nobody sat there and said, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. That's not the way it happened. But it did happen. It did happen, and it happened because Bob Wood had the courage to roll the dice repeatedly. And to move shows, and to uh, and to listen, he called. He called me my Jewish lunatic. You know, before he took that job, I don't think he knew too many Jewish people. You know, but then he had met Don Rickles. He met me, Erwin Siegelstein, who was one of the the key executives over there. So he, uh, it was kind of an education for him. Now, talk about you use the word courage. All in the Family is probably one of the most courageous shows in the history of television. Talk about how closely you monitored the content of that show and how much autonomy you gave Norman Lear in making that show. 
Well, Norman had total autonomy. You know, I wasn't about to tell him how to make his show. I mean, he was, he did it by himself. Nobody listened. Well, I, I enjoyed a very good relationship with him, as did Perry Lafferty, who was running the West Coast. But he, you know, you have to be smart enough when you have a star producer to let him be a star. He knew how to do the show better than we did. Uh, and I didn't want to get involved with, in the content. I pushed him. I said, go further. Go further. You know, our broadcast standards department, on the other hand, I don't think uh, the guy in charge had a good night's sleep for six years. I mean, that thing, he turned gray in a year, having to deal with Norman Lear every week. And then Maud came along, and that was even worse. When we started doing shows about abortion, and, uh, you know, it was... But uh, Norman, God bless him, you know, he said, I'm going to do my show the way I want to do it, or cancel it. And, you know, we weren't going to cancel a show with a 60 share. So uh, he pretty... You know, there are occasional flare-ups, and I, but I think overall... You know, the one good thing about the show that we opened with, the pilot had everything but the kitchen sink in there. So he kind of established what the boundaries were going to be right up front. You knew, with all the talk about Spicks and your Hebes and all, that you knew what the boundaries were. So uh, nothing would surprise people after that. But it was still, I look at the reruns uh, on, on uh, Nick at Night, and they still hold up. What a great show that was. And there's nothing out there that even comes close. You know, and ironically, I don't know whether it could get on the air today. In this, in this time of political correctness, and I, I don't know. I doubt it. Now, let's talk about the lineage uh, of all of the shows that spun out of All in the Family, starting with the Jeffersons. Talk about the development of that show. Well, it, uh, the Jeffersons was a more of an or, a organic spinoff than some of the others because uh, they were next door neighbors to Archie Bunker. They lived right next door, and uh, Sherman Helmsley was not, he didn't play that role. Initially, there was a guy by the name of Mel Stewart who played George Jefferson. But Lionel, the kid who played Lionel, went on to, uh, to go on the Jeffersons, and, uh, and I think Isabel Sanford, if I'm not mistaken. But it just seemed that, that what a natural. You know, this is a next door neighbors who we don't use that much, but have got, they really have got the recognizability and they're funny. Why don't you give, uh, the, you know, their own show? He came up with the concept of, uh, you know, moving on up, you know, of, uh, of them kind of like a new way to do the Beverly Hillboys. And, uh, and it was really a cute idea. Uh, great cast. I thought Sherman Helmsley was inspired casting. And that went on the air. It was a hit from the moment it went on. I believe when it went on, it went on after All in the Family. That's an uh, instant hit. You know, Maud was, uh, she made a guest shot, a guest appearance in All in the Family, and that's all it was, was a guest appearance. And I looked at the show on the air and said, who the hell is that woman? You know, I discovered B. Arthur, who's been around for years and years, a major stage actress. I didn't know who she was. And called him up, and I said, you gotta, you got to do something with her. And he didn't want to do it. You know, God bless no one. never wanted to do anything. And I had, a, I had a bully him into doing it. Please do it. Please. And he did a spinoff episode, uh, which was great. You know, and on the basis of that spinoff episode, you know, we just uh, we ordered the show up. That was Paley's favorite show. He thought it was so smart. Loved that show. And, uh, and put it, uh, as I recall, I think we, we put it on after Good Times on, on Tuesday, but it, it just instant hit. It just, uh, you know, the audience just, they sense. They, they, they just sense uh, good stuff. You know, Esther Roll had been uh, a maid. She played Florida on uh, Maud, and she was popular, and we figured, well, you know, this was Norman's idea. Why not uh, go home to the projects? And uh, it's kind of a geographical problem because Maud lived in Westchester, and the projects were in Chicago, but nobody ever picked up on it. Uh, and, and he put together a great cast with John Amos and, of course, Jimmy Walker, who stole the show, and that was a, an immediate hit. That went opposite happy, happy Days, as I recall. 
and just knock the hell out of him. Uh, one day at a time wasn't a spinoff. It was just uh, he had an idea to do this show, and we we ended up doing about two pilots on that. The first pilot didn't work. It just was, you know, the uh, Mackenzie Phillips was just so strident. And, uh, and I don't think Valerie Bartinelli was in the first pilot. The second one was really good, and that, uh, that went on uh, and was on for years on Sunday night. And I think that covered all the uh, Norman Lear shows. Now, philosophically, you start looking at a good thing like an All in the Family, and you start seeing elements come up. At what point do you start looking for spin-offs strategically? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think. I think if something, if you look at something and you say, "Hey, that could work," and it's not going to hurt the show, you know, the things that we spun out of there, Maud was never a part of All in the Family. She was just a guest shot. Uh, you know, the Jeffersons. You know, they were on very seldom. They were on that every week. They were major parts of the show, so there was not that much uh, that was lost. Just like Florida, on Maud was in maybe half a dozen pages. So you weren't going to lose that much. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we did uh, we did Rhoda as a spinoff of Mary, and I think it hurt Mary Tyler to lose that character. And uh, I mean, there's a case where it was a very successful spinoff until I came up with the stupid idea of marrying her off. And the marriage was a great stunt. I mean, it was got that hour got one of the biggest ratings all season. But we, the heart and soul of the show went out the moment we got her married. She had no more problems. Her biggest problem was dates, men. And the moment she was happily married, we kind of the character lost all of its appeal. So it was really a stupid idea, in retrospect. And we got a divorce, but it was never the same. Uh, and I'm trying to think. Those were the most successful spinoffs. Let's talk about some of the other important programs on that CBS schedule. Uh, Kojak. Where did the idea for that show originate? It originated uh, with uh, the man who uh, was our representative from Universal, Tom Tannenbaum. Uh, he came in one day with a script called, uh, a Zo I think it was, it wasn't called Marcus Nelson Murders then. It was called... Uh, Zoltan, or something, some strange name. It was an Abbey Man theatrical script that was about was about the Miranda and uh, the Miranda Act, and uh, and the name of the officer was Zoltan. And it was a two and a half hour busted theatrical. It never got made. And I read it. And I said, this is really good. You know, we ought to we ought to do this as a as a movie. It's a great movie. I read it. I remember I had lunch at a Chinese restaurant around the corner from CBS and read the script at lunch and couldn't put it down. And he came back a short time later and he said, listen, I got an idea. I can get Telly Savalas to play the Zoltan character, which was later changed to Kojak. Can, uh, this should be considered as a, as a pilot. And I said, great, get, get him and everything and we'll consider it. And we got uh, really, I, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the director, really good director came in to, uh, who's now a big theatrical director. But anyway, he did, he did the, the film, it was called Marcus Nelson Murders, won several Emmys. You know, Abby Mann was, at that point in time, a monumental television writer. He wrote Judgment in Nuremberg, and uh, big hit, and Paley fell in love with it, and we wanted, ordered the series up and put it in our schedule. And I found, got a call from Tom Tannenbaum saying, well, you know, I, I have to tell you this, we don't have Telly sign. This is after we've already pretty much announced the schedule. It's in. It's on Wednesday at 10, and I got nuts. You know, I said, well, I don't care what you have to do, Todd. You, you better get him signed. And that was a cliffhanger for about a week because he was not the easiest guy to, to, to deal with, Telly Savalas. But at any rate, we got it, and, uh, and, and it went on the uh, instant hit. And, uh, I mean, it's just one of those things. They love the character. The shows the first year weren't very good. It really took, because Abby Mann kind of walked away from the series. But it took about a year to really get a good creative team working on it. And uh, But it was a smash hit. I mean, really big show. 
And to me, it had the best of all worlds. It was a smart show. It was uh, very well crafted. It was the perfect demographics that we were looking for. And there was a major star attached to it. I mean, he was such a big star. That show made a, an enormous celebrity out of him. You know, up until then, he played heavies. His claim to fame was playing a pervert in The Dirty Dozen. Now, how was the script that you read that you fell in love with changed or adapted to be tailored to sort of Telly Savalas's persona? We just changed the name. That was it? Changed the name, and you, you, know, you added little things like the lollipop, and I, not, not much. I mean, it was, a, it was really good. He brought his own personality. You know, when you have an actor that has such a strong personality, whether the lines are there or not, he will get his personality across. Now let's talk about another one of the landmark shows in television history, MASH. How far along was the development of that show when you took over as programming chief? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't? No. No, and that was a very simple development. That's one of the very few where... Bill Self was ahead of 20th, and he came in to see uh, Perry Lafferty, who was in charge of the West Coast, and said, we'd like to do a pilot for MASH. And we had Alan Alda, who wants to star as Hawkeye, and we said, go. And it was very simple. They got Larry Gelbart to write it, wrote a terrific script. I, don't, I think there were no notes on the script. Uh, got uh, Gene Reynolds to direct the pilot, and it was a perfect pilot. Perfect. There was nothing... The best pilot I've ever seen. In the sense you didn't have to change anything. It was all there. We put it on the air. Uh, our scheduling wasn't as good as the show. Because the first year we put it on Sunday at 8 o'clock, opposite really tough competition. And we put Anna and the King at 7.30, which died. And, I, you know, the show just uh, didn't work on Sunday night. But in spite of the ratings, I mean, everybody had started winning awards. And everybody was so high on it that we picked the show up and moved it to 8.30 Saturday following All in the Family the second year. And immediately was the number two show. So So what was your Saturday schedule now at this point? At this point, with it was All in the Family, MASH, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, Bob Newhart, and I believe Carol Burnett. Probably the best night of programming. Yeah, it was really good. Now the following year, MASH was so strong we had the Jeffersons, we moved the Jeffersons into that spot, and MASH moved to Tuesday, because we needed a really strong show to, to anchor Tuesday. So that's why I say Bob Wood was, uh, a lot of presidents would have said, are you crazy? You're not going to, I don't want to move that. You know, so he had great courage. But that's how we got so strong, because you, knowing how to get most advantage out of these great shows. Now all of a sudden, on Tuesday night, you have MASH and Maud as a combination and just knock the hell out of ABC with their comedies. You need to change tapes again? Wow, that went fast. 